All right, well, this evening we're going to look at the last few verses of Luke chapter 12. So let me go ahead and read those as we begin. Beginning in verse 54, and he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say, a shower is coming, and so it turns out. And when you see a south wind blowing, you say, it will be a hot day. And it turns out that way. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky, but why do you not analyze this present time? And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you were going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him so that he may not drag you before the judge And the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. Well, may the Lord bless his word again to our understanding this evening. Now, this morning, remember, we saw that as Jesus was thinking about the condition of those around him, the Jews who knew God's will but refused to listen and to do it about the Gentiles, having yet to hear the word and how hard it would be for them on the day of judgment, uh, he told his disciples how he was going to fix the problem. He was going to cast that fire upon the earth, the fire of his Holy Spirit to empower his people to preach the gospel so that more might be saved. And I think we'll all recognize there's a big difference between before and after Pentecost. He also mentioned that before he could do that, he still had a baptism that he had to undergo, his sufferings on the cross to take away the sins of his people so that he might, as it were, purchase the Holy Spirit, merit his return. Adam lost the Spirit. Jesus Christ brings him back. Now, again, we recognize the Spirit was working even before Jesus finished his work, but he was working on the basis of Jesus' work. That work was retroactively applied as it's also applied in the future to us from when it actually took place. And then Jesus also told us what the result of this fire would be, and that is increased division. When Jesus said this, most of the human race, by the way, that's still true today, most of the human race, even most of the Jews in that time were still in the devil's camp. The Spirit's work, His sending this fire into the world, would bring more people into His kingdom, which would stir up more division, even within the households of His people, which until that time were relatively peaceful. The gospel divides. But this is something that had to happen for the kingdom of heaven to move forward. People get upset when they're confronted with the truth, but people are never saved unless they are confronted with the truth, division, You know, anger, warfare is inevitable. That's the way the kingdom of heaven uh, advances. Well, Jesus now turns his thoughts to judgment day, and he begins to challenge the crowds who had been listening to be on the right side of the division, to receive him as their Messiah, as their Savior, while it's still time before they have to stand before the judge. Now, first, he challenges them to look at the signs that God had given as to what was really taking place in their day in the same way that they would look at the signs of the weather. Now, you read in verse 54, and he was also saying to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, immediately you say a shower is coming, and so it turns out. If you're familiar with the um, the geography in um, uh, in Palestine, you know that the Mediterranean Sea was to the west. When the sea was heated up by the sun, water vapor would rise into the sky where it would cool and condense, and we call this the hydrologic cycle. And then air currents would move it over the land, and it would, uh, you know, drop its rain. When they saw a cloud forming in the west, uh, they knew that it was going to rain. You know, as as I was thinking about that example of Christ, it reminded me of an interesting example in the Old Testament of this very thing. When the Lord just grew weary, his patience had come to an end with the northern kingdom of Israel under the rule of Ahab, 
his wife Jezebel in one of the most wicked times in Israel. As a matter of fact, once the kingdom divided, there never was a righteous king in Israel. They were all wicked kings. They had been worshiping other gods, turning to other gods, and God sent Elijah the prophet to call for a drought to remove the water, remove the rain. James writes in James 5.17, Elijah was a man uh, with a nature like ours, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the earth for three years and six months. And then after God humbled them through this drought, uh, he mercifully sent rain again through Elijah. James continues, then he prayed again, and the sky poured rain and the earth produced its fruit. But the interesting thing is that it didn't happen right away. If you remember the account in 1 Kings chapter 18, Elijah bowed to the ground and prayed seven times. And each time he sent his servant up to the top of Carmel in order to look out over the ocean, over the Mediterranean, to see if he could see anything. And for the first six times, the servant saw nothing. But on the seventh time, the servant saw a cloud as small as a man's hand coming up from the sea. And that was the sign that the Lord was sending rain. Now, that example not only shows us the importance of godliness and persistent prayer, because James also tells us the effective prayer of a righteous man can accomplish much. It also shows us the connection between the sign and what it was that was coming. The sign was the cloud. What was coming was the rain. Jesus says, you make that connection. Then he gave them this other example. Verse 55, and when you see a south wind blowing, you say it will be a hot day, and it turns out that way. You know, I don't know if you, if you knew this either, but um, Israel, you know, the land of Palestine is, is essentially around the same, um, what would you say, I'm not sure if it's latitude or longitude, but it's, it's the same distance towards the north as California. And because of that, our climates are quite similar. I looked at what, you know, the range of temperatures are throughout uh, the year in Israel, and they're, they're very much like certain parts of California, maybe not the Central Valley. It gets quite a bit hotter here than it does there. But there were times there, like there are also uh, here, where the wind would blow from the south. And when it did, it would bring air from the warmer regions that were further south, Egypt, Ethiopia, and Arabia. When the wind was coming from that direction, they knew things were going to heat up. You know, uh, being uh, from Southern California, having been born and raised in, in California, we had something like that that was called Santa Ana. You know, Santa Ana winds that would heat up Southern California, and that's when the wind would blow from the east where the desert was and would blow all that heat over into um, Southern California. And when it happened around Christmas, it sort of made it odd. You know, you have a hot day in the 80s that's dry around Christmas. It just doesn't seem to match. But we're, we're familiar with that. I think when the winds blow around here, right, when there's a, a weather change taking place, usually we get a very strong wind coming from the northwest blowing this direction from the delta. Sometimes it, it blows from the other direction. And then we know perhaps more serious weather is coming. It signals a climate change. And I think if we lived in, you know, in Florida and uh, on the East Coast, we'd probably soon become aware of the signs that a hurricane was coming or a tropical storm. The Lord is actually the one who makes that connection. He gives us the signs of these changes that are coming so that we can get ready for what it is that is coming. Now, Jesus says, you see those signs, and you know how to interpret those things when it comes to the weather. But he points out that God has done the same thing here with regard to his work of redemption. And yet, you're not able to see that. So he continues in verse 56. You hypocrites, you know how to analyze the appearance of the earth and the sky. But why do you not analyze this present time? the signs that God had given, that he was fulfilling the promise to send the Messiah. Those things had been happening by this time for some time, and they were all around them, but they couldn't seem to see them. You know, let, I thought it would be uh, helpful just to review some of the things that were taking place. Now, not every one of the Jews 
saw all these things taking place, but I imagine that many of them were aware of them and had heard them from others. For instance, he had sent the angels to tell the shepherds, as we saw this morning, that their Savior had been born in Bethlehem. And that's where the Lord said that he would send the Messiah into Bethlehem, Micah 5, 2. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrathah, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. There were those who heard the story of the shepherds. He led the Magi from the east by the star to find the child who had been born king. And as you know, when Herod found out from them that they came to worship this king, he wanted to know where this king was so that he might kill him. And when he sent his soldiers to the place where they had found the star, it fulfilled what the word of the Lord through the prophet Jeremiah in Jeremiah 31 verse 15. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. We know that before that took place, the Lord had warned Joseph and Mary to take the child and to flee to Egypt, uh, and they remained there until the death of Herod. Afterwards, they returned and settled in Nazareth, fulfilling what the Lord said in Hosea 11 verse 1, out of Egypt I called my son. Then we know there were more contemporary things as well as our Lord Jesus Christ began his ministry. John the Baptist went out before him to announce his coming and to prepare the people to receive him, which is what the Lord said he would do, send a messenger before him through the prophet Malachi. Behold, I am going to send my messenger, and he will clear the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple And the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. The interesting thing about this is notice who it is who is coming to his temple, and that is the Lord himself. And that is what our Lord Jesus Christ did. His way was prepared, he came to his temple, and he cleansed his temple, didn't he, with his his whip. When Jesus appeared for baptism, John the Baptist pointed to him and said, in John 1, 29, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. After Jesus went out into the wilderness to be tempted and returned to Galilee to begin preaching, Jesus opened his ministry with these words in Mark 1, 15. The time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. You know, the interesting thing about this is that our Lord Jesus is talking about a particular prophecy, a prophetic timetable that was being fulfilled right at that moment. The time is fulfilled. What time was he talking about? He was actually pointing them to the fulfillment of the 69th week of the 70 weeks of Daniel. If you recall in Daniel 9.25, he says, from the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem to the coming of Messiah the Prince will be seven weeks and 62 weeks. And the idea being that the first part of it is going to be for the restoration of, of the um, uh, Jerusalem, and then the remainder is going to be till the coming of the Messiah. And it's actually been shown that there was a decree issued at a time that, that terminates right with the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. So those who had been attuned to what the Lord had said in the scriptures would be aware that he was coming. And of course, our Lord Jesus Christ gave them plenty of evidence of who he was through his preaching, through his miracles. He was fulfilling what the Lord said Messiah would do. These were the divine credentials that proved who he was. Remember when John the Baptist sent his messengers to Jesus to ask him the question in Luke 7, 20, are you the expected one? Or do we look for someone else? John apparently was having questions, perhaps because of the duress that he was under in prison. But Jesus didn't just say, go back and tell John yes. But he said, go back and report to John, in verse 22, what you have seen and heard. The blind receive sight. The lame walk. The lepers are cleansed. And the deaf hear. The dead are raised up. The poor have the gospel 
preached to them. Now again, these Jews could look at the signs of changes in the weather and they could interpret those things properly, but they couldn't interpret the even clearer signs that God had sent his Redeemer into the world. Now Jesus said that on their part, this was hypocrisy. Here was a group of people that were pretending to be looking for the Messiah and his kingdom. But now that he was clearly before their eyes, they refused to receive him. Some suggest that perhaps Jesus had in mind the Pharisees who were also among the group, whom we know recognized Jesus. They knew who he was, and that's why they were guilty of so great a sin, the unpardonable sin, that they were claiming that Jesus was doing what he was doing by the power of the devil rather than the Spirit of God, and that was only to hang on to their positions of power and affluence under the Romans. So it was hypocrisy. Now, that's one thing we might want to be careful about, labeling somebody as far as sharing the gospel with others, but we can if they happen to be guilty of it, as these people were. But then Jesus goes on very graciously to plead with them, and I think this is the most important thing to see to plead with them while there is still time. Now we read in verses 57 through 59 this, And why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? For while you were going with your opponent to appear before the magistrate, on your way there, make an effort to settle with him, so that he may not drag you before the judge, and the judge turn you over to the officer, and the officer throw you into prison. I say to you, you will not get out of there until you have paid the very last cent. Now again, remember who it is that Jesus is talking to. This is Israel. These are the people of God. He came to his own. His own did not receive him. And Jesus is the faithful shepherd. He is the faithful pastor of of Israel. And as their faithful shepherd, even though they're rejecting him, even though they're being hypocritical, he is still pointing them in the right direction, and he's warning them of what will happen if they don't take it. Now, this is, again, an analogy. This is an illustration, one they were very familiar with in their culture. They knew how the process worked, and they knew it was to their advantage to settle their case before they actually go to court when something worse would happen. So Jesus tells them, first of all, that they should know enough about who he is and what it is they need to receive him on their own without someone having to tell them that that's what they need to do. Verse 57, why do you not even on your own initiative judge what is right? Judge what the, what, you know, the time is. Judge, see the fulfillment of these things. See that the Messiah is here and receive him. You should be doing that without somebody having to tell you to do it. Israel really had a lot of light. That's the reason why Jesus said that um, things would go more harshly for them on the day of judgment because they weren't living up to the light that they had. And that's exactly what they were doing here. The Lord expects us, He expects His people to do what we know. Now, thankfully, by God's grace, we will because we have the Holy Spirit working within us. But if we know that God calls us to do something, that he wants us to do something, then we really no longer have an excuse for not doing that thing. These people had no excuse. They knew the truth. They should be on their own initiative doing what is right. And then he gives them this example that they're all familiar with, again, to illustrate what happened if they did not receive him. If somebody has a legal claim on you, monetarily or perhaps some crime, and was bringing you before the magistrate, Jesus is saying, wouldn't you make every effort to settle this matter out of court rather than face a severe verdict from the court? And of course, the answer which the Jews knew the answer to was, yes, of course, you would do that. Then why not do it when it's God who actually has that claim on you, okay? They had broken God's law. He was going to bring them before the court on judgment day, but they had the opportunity to settle out of court if they would simply receive 
him. If they did that, all their accounts would be settled. So shouldn't they receive him now rather than face him on that day when they would be cast into prison, when they would be cast into hell and not come out of there until they had paid their full debt? You know, the sad thing is understanding hell. We know they would never come out of there. Uh, the debt that we owe to God, as we know I think quite well by now, is not a, a finite or limited debt that can be paid over a period of a thousand years or 10,000 years or a million years. It's a debt that we can never pay because the debt is an infinite debt, because we have offended an infinitely holy and worthy God. That's the reason why hell goes on forever, because you can never as a you know, in limited suffering, and we're, we're, we're limited creatures, we can only suffer so much. We can never, through uh, unlimited time, ever uh, suffer an infinite amount. And again, that's, as I've said, that's why it never, ever comes to an end. They'd be cast into prison. They wouldn't come out until it's paid, but it's never going to be paid. And that's also the reason why they needed to trust in Jesus, because... He is the only one who can pay such a debt. That's the reason, one of the reasons, why Jesus had to be both God and man. Because his suffering on the cross has infinite value. It is uh, infinitely satisfying to the justice of God because he is infinitely worthy. He alone can satisfy his Father's justice. So Jesus is saying to them, See who I am. Look around you. Look at the signs of the time. Know who I am. Believe in me. If you do, the account will be settled. You will escape hell, and you will receive eternal life. And again, that's what the Lord continues to say to us in the day of his mercy. If we have trusted the Lord Jesus Christ, then our debts have been settled, and we are forgiven. We will not have to face the judge except to hear the words that we're acquitted. We'll see him as a savior rather than as a judge. But of course, if you haven't trusted Jesus, if you haven't settled accounts with him, you had better do so now while you're still on the way. And that's also true of the people around us who don't know him. This is still the day of his mercy. There's still the possibility of settling the account before that day comes. If that account is not settled, God will throw them He'll throw you, if you're not trusting Jesus, into hell. And they will not come out of there until they have paid the very last cent. You know, the fact that hell goes on forever is one of the things that makes it so terrible. And we really have no idea. The illustration of eternity that uh, Thomas Watson gave on one occasion, picturing the earth, which in his day, he didn't even know exactly how big it was, but even in his conception, as a ball of sand, one giant ball of sand, and every million years a bird flies by and brushes off one grain of that sand. When that ball the size of the earth has finally been whittled away to nothing, just one moment in eternity has passed. That is a very, very long time, and it's much longer than we can conceive, but that is how long hell goes on. The only way to escape it is through Jesus. Jesus is telling them, read the signs of the times, know the mercy of the Lord extended to you, receive him. And we need to do our best also to tell others the same thing, to show them who Jesus is, to extend God's mercy to them and to warn them to settle their account with God before the day of mercy is over for them, which it is, as we know, uh, at death. Well, may the Lord uh, encourage us through this uh, in one sense that, that our debts are settled, but may he also encourage us to do what we can to help others in this regard as well. Well, let's, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we?